You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. This is actually a good segue into this uh, report that came out from TD. And we invited the author of the report, who I I don't actually believe responded at all. I mean, maybe they declined, but I I don't think they they got back to us at all, Uh, which is unfortunate because I'm I'm a TD client. I give TD a lot of money. But uh, TD has said Canada's standard of living is falling behind. And this report talks about the fact that, well, there may be some on paper economic growth in this country. It's not translating in the real economy to real prosperity for real Canadians. And I I think this is a very important report because it's saying that Canada has been lagging behind the US, behind other advanced economies. The, The money quote here, no pun intended, from the report author, economic growth does not necessarily equate to economic prosperity. I want to unpack this and some of the other economic trends a little bit more here with Philip Cross, who is the former chief economic analyst at Statistics Canada and is also a Monk Senior Fellow in Economics for the Macdonald Laurier Institute. Uh, Philip, always good to talk to you. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me back, Andrew. So, I mean, let's first off talk about the sales pitch that the federal government is giving here, which is that everything is great. I mean, that is probably the least convincing pitch if you talk to real people in this country. But what is it they're drawing from that's making things look so rosy? Uh, As an economist, frankly, I'm a a bit at a loss. Probably that the unemployment rate is uh, at such a low level. And a lot of that reflects more that a lot of people left the labor force that were having trouble finding workers and finding people to do jobs, not that they're not that the economy is booming. Uh, if you look at any other metric, whether it's um, uh, GDP growth, I- incomes, uh, inflation, and in particular, if you look at the most dynamic uh, sectors of the economy, the ones that determine our growth going forward, which are business invest- investment and exports, we're way down the uh, totem pole on, the, on these measures. Yeah, and I, I think this TD report, I mean, obviously, the banks have their own forecasts. And, you know, you could find three economists and between them, perhaps five opinions on uh, what's happening in a particular country here. But I, I think when we're looking at the way that we're lagging behind other advanced economies on standard of living, that that's very key here, because a lot of the times we've been told, Uh, by our government that, oh, well, you know, when we compare ourselves to the U.S. and the U.K. and European countries, we're we're doing great. But here we are. We're not in that same league right now. No, and I'd encourage your um, viewers, instead of looking at the TD report, look at my report that came out from the Fraser Institute a couple weeks ago that covered a lot of this ground, uh, that noted that Uh, Our GDP growth has fallen way behind the U.S. That was true before the pandemic. It occurred during the pandemic. And now in the recovery uh, from the pandemic, we've fallen behind the U.S. by a good 10 percentage points in growth. And as I said, it's it's especially because of if you compare the, the sectors, what explains this difference between the U.S. and Canada, it's especially business investment and uh, exports. You can't blame this on an aging economy. You can't say that we've exhausted technological changes. It's something very specific to this country. And uh, in this report, basically, I go on that, uh, that I think it's an increasingly anti-business culture and, and way of talking to, to firms that uh, I find is the biggest difference between Canada and the U.S., yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you, you mentioned, and I, I think I actually pulled the quote out here, you, you talk about the fact that uh, the importance of a nation's culture to economic growth. Without a culture that supports entrepreneurship and innovation, even the best policies and institutions will produce disappointing results. So right now we have, I think, this tendency, especially when we're talking about inflation, for our leaders to just say, well, Canada is a passenger in a global trend right now. It's like, oh, there's inflation in the UK. So inflation in Canada is not really our fault. It's everywhere. Whereas you're saying that in Canada, there actually is something that's a very specific and uniquely Canadian phenomenon that's driving down growth. Uh, Very much so. And it's because business investment in this country over the last decade has fallen 20 percent well, in the U.S., it's grown 20% over the same period. Uh, and the importance of business investment is that it embeds technological changes. It, it drives your competitors going forward. That's why, again, over the last decade, our exports have fallen slightly while the U.S. has continued to grow. So uh, it's something very specific, and it's, you know, it's very specific to business investment and exports. Uh, yes, we've tried to fluff up growth by having uh, low interest rates and 
having large government uh, deficits and spending and having a housing boom. But none of those are sustainable in the long run if you don't have investment, jobs, and exports. We're an exporting nation. We count on exports for one third of our income. Uh, between exports and business investment, you have well over a third of our economy going absolutely nowhere. Uh, this is going to result in stagnant incomes over the longer term. Now, how much, I mean, you talk about how culture changes slowly here, and, I, and I'm wondering how much of it is really influenced by changes in government, or if the culture has sort of a, an evolution in this country that is influenced, yes, but not as radically by policy changes. Well, that's the one thing I ha I'm optimistic about, is that culture j does change slowly. I think there really is a... Uh, a desire uh, or still a, an impulse for innovation and entrepreneurship in this country. I don't think you can kill that off. But at the same time, you know, you go back to, you know, you talked about the TD uh, report. Economists have been recommending that governments in this country do a lot of things that the governments have actually done. You know, we've adopted free trade with all the major G7 countries. We have the highest level of education in the G7. We subsidize research and development uh, like crazy, as shown by the, the huge subsidies given to the auto firms recently. So we've done a lot of things, and yet our growth continues to sputter. And that's why I go back to saying it's probably more than just a, a little tweak of a policy here or there. We have to go back and look at how it is we talk to the business sector internationally and in, the, in this country to make firms want to invest and spend in this country. Now, I want to just preface this by saying what I'm about to argue is not at all my point, but I, I'm trying to say, you know, how would the government right now federally respond to your point? And they'd say, well, just look at the 13 billion we've given to Volkswagen. Look at the billions we're handing out in corporate subsidies. That's that's uh, showing our investment in business, our investment in entrepreneurship. What yeah. what would you say to that? Because that's the government's answer to you saying there's not a business climate here is to throw money at these companies. Yeah. Well, I think what the government really revealed itself was when the head of Germany came over last winter in the middle of a major crisis. I mean, I was in Europe last winter. Trust me, it was cold. It, it mm -hmm. was cold in restaurants. I mean, they turned the temperature down. They were they ran out of natural gas. So the head of Germany comes over here. He asked Canada to step up natural gas exports. We respond by saying, no, there isn't a business case for it. Yeah. Are you kidding? Which is news to the people there wanting to buy it. Yeah, here's a head of a, G, a fellow G7 country who we should be disposed to help out just because he's a fellow G7, never mind that he's a good customer, asking us to increase our energy exports, and we say there isn't a business case. Uh, that's farcical. Uh, we won't build pipelines. We, we dis, uh, discourage oil and gas investment. Uh, that's the type of, and, and the, you know, oil and gas is the largest industry in this country, not auto manufacturing. Uh, this is oil and gas is twice as important as the auto industry. So, yes, you can go out and give subsidies to the auto industry, whether or not they'll pay off in the long term. I don't know. As uh, many people pointed out, you know, it's not at all clear that uh, who's going to win the electric uh, vehicle wars in the future. Um, but, you know, while we're doing that, we're discouraging an industry that is twice as important just the oil and gas industry by itself, never mind adding in pipelines and industries like that. So I think the government revealed its true colors about the way it talks to the to the business community in the way that uh, it responded to Schultz's uh, request last winter. Uh, is your view, I mean, because to go back to the global picture here, and I, I think inflation has probably been one of the most acute measures of of the, the state of the economy, if you were to talk to most people, because it's the one they're seeing, but in general, unemployment and, and all of this factors in as well. But, but is your view that if Canada had implemented some of the stuff you're talking about, that we would have been a little bit more insulated from some of these global trends over the last couple of years? Oh, I think certainly, um, partly because, you know, uh, the biggest source of inflation over the last year was food and energy. And the government stands back and goes, oh, that's something we don't control. Actually, because we import so much food and our, our gasoline prices are directly linked to the U.S., every time the Canadian dollar drops, uh, that costs consumers a higher food and energy and, and uh, other prices for imported goods. It's quite striking that when the last winter, when the oil and gas prices blew through the roof, our dollar didn't do anything. And it's because the international community understood 
that there, our government would not allow more investment in, in the oil and gas industry, and we wouldn't be able to profit from that. If we allowed the oil and gas industry to profit from those high prices, the dollar would have risen, gas, gasoline and food prices would have come down, and inflation would have been lower. So there's a direct connection between the two. Philip Cross is with us. He is with, I mean, you're basically with everywhere. You're with the Fraser Institute, McDonald Laurier, formerly Statistics Canada, and you produce great work wherever you are. Thanks so much for coming on, Philip. Always good to talk to you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.